breeze came up and apparently some of the poison got into my eye. Man-made pollution cooked up a cocktail of poison. She basically said he, his insides were just torn apart. The blooms teeming with liver toxin and brain toxin. You can't taste it, smell it, or anything. Scientists are shocked by what they just found in dolphins. Well, it's very, very startling. And wait till you see what they're finding in people. Everyone that was tested was positive. I'm very worried about the long-term effects. And it's not just the water when toxic algae turns to toxic dust. And it turns into a powder, and then the winds would pick up that powder. We're digging into the science, the dangers, and possible remedies as we investigate a toxic crisis in Florida. We need to come up with some answers quickly. This tube contains microorganisms called cyanobacteria. They produce cyanotoxins, some of the most potent natural poisons on Earth. And those same poisons are now coursing through our rivers, lakes, and estuaries all across the state of Florida. And this is something that is affecting people and striking pets in ways you may not expect. We'll start with this nine-year-old poodle named Finn. He slipped out of his fence in September of 2018, and his owners found him all wet by the St. Lucie River. He's completely limp. He just wouldn't move. So their first thought was rat poisoning. This is Costa. She was poisoned just down the street. She was not flinching. She was just staring. Vets treated six dogs in the same neighborhood in the town of Stewart, all poisoned. Why in a short period of time were all these dogs showing up with the exact same symptoms and the exact same lab results? Well, Finn the Poodle would solve that mystery. He died at the vet and his necropsy was a bombshell. That he died from the toxic blue green algae. His, his yeah. body was a basically mess. infested with it. Scientists said South Florida River water was not safe to drink. And now you see what happens when dogs gave it a try. They were putting needles in her and her eyes weren't even blinking or flinching or anything. Ashley Guzzi said Costa slipped out of her fence and a neighbor saw her drinking from the St. Lucie River. <sighs> It was maybe four or five hours. After she drank the sludge? Yes. That she collapsed? Yes. She walked a few feet and she was kind of rocking and then she just went over. And while the toxic water does this to pets, scientists who study the toxins, like Dr. Larry Brand, say it can also affect humans years after they've been exposed. And that's probably one of the more insidious parts of this thing is that there are no short-term symptoms. To see why, you have to see what's in this green slime and how our government feeds it. Look at this. That's the water in Florida right now. A state of emergency in Florida. Uh, well, phew, I wish I hadn't splashed that on myself. You sort of forget how close, clean, and marvelous Florida really is. First, politicians sell Florida as a paradise for clean water and cheap subdivisions. Then we see how those things don't mix. I, it's predominantly the commercial, the residential, and the agricultural operations north of the lake. Running from Polk County through Orlando. All the way down through Orlando into the lake. Leaking septic tanks and chemical fertilizer leach into Lake Okeechobee, where it feeds these blooms of cyanobacteria we call toxic algae. And then to prevent flooding around the lake, our government pumps it east and west through our rivers and estuaries, where it emits a toxin called microcystin that struck the pets like venom. All the dogs had high levels of microcystin in um, the urine and the blood. Or can sicken people over time. So this is what people are exposed to. Well, scientists link microcystin to liver damage. The cyanobacteria also produce a toxin called BMAA that they've correlated with brain damage. The BMAA in these blooms can lead to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. In Guam, researchers associated a spike in ALS-like disease in the 1950s to people who ate fruit bats contaminated with high levels of this BMAA. And when Dr. Brand tested shellfish in South Florida, he found they had more BMAA than the bats. I found some uh, fish and crabs which had concentrations of BMAA twice as high as the fruit bats of Guam. You have no idea you've been exposed to it 
And then 10 or 20 years later, you might come down with a neurodegenerative disease. We'll examine that theory a little later in our program. But first, there is a basic warning about tainted water that people often miss. You see a bloom of cyanobacteria. You don't want to go swimming in it. You don't want to eat any of the seafood in it. Which brings us to our trip to the lake. How many fish did you catch here? Uh, about 12. Lots of and two men at opposite sides of the table. A lot of people can get sick. <laughs> yeah. So Ronaldo Diaz with the nonprofit Water Keepers is testing the levels of toxins in the lake. Yeah, the state needs to do something about it. Right. While Pastor Rob Johnson is preparing his feast. We have a toxic water crisis. You know that. Yeah, I've heard about it. I've heard about it. But, but you wouldn't want to err on the side of caution? Of course, of course. But we're not, are we there now? Are we there now? Would you go uh, to I'm going to go with yes. Ronaldo Diaz says there's just not enough communication. You see signs showing where to dump the fish guts, but no signs warning about the toxins in the water. So if you saw a sign posted and said, warning sign of bacteria, you wouldn't eat no, the fish. No, I wouldn't eat the fish. And when the water looked like split pea soup, you know, guacamole, I still saw people at the fillet tables pulling fish out of these waters, still eating them. But I saw a couple kids jumping in the water and swimming around in that green sludge, so it's pretty, uh, pretty tough thing to deal with. After scrapping septic tank inspections and regulations meant to protect the water, the state solution hinges on building more reservoirs to store more bad water until it can be treated and released. The ultimate solution would be having a reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee. I got that into the water bill working with the Trump administration. If you have the water go to the, the reservoir, you can clean it, send it to the Everglades in Florida Bay, which needs the water, and then you obviate the need to have to discharge all this polluted water into the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie rivers. And while those plans will take years to complete, our government is moving forward with another plan to pump polluted water deep underground far below our supply of drinking water, but environmentalists fear it could still mix into the water table. Can you guarantee there would not be any break or leak in these wells so that this water could leach into our water supply? What I can tell you is that this type of technology has been around for a very long period of time. Offshore drilling has also been around for a very long time, and as we saw with the BP disaster, it can fail. Do you know for sure you couldn't have a break or a leak that could cause this to seep into the aquifer? Well, what I can tell you is that the technology exists for these types of wells to move water into the boulder zone. Back at the lake, Ronaldo Diaz wasn't testing water in the slugs of green slime. He took samples last October, after the summer blooms faded. But anywhere between five to 10, you can see the line. And he still found microcystin approaching the level considered too toxic to touch. The range is five to 10. What's considered safe to drink? Safe to drink would be one part per billion. Microcystin is still present in the water and it's present to a significant amount. Again, that's the liver toxin that killed Finn the Poodle, leaving families to wait and worry as more blooms pop up this year. It's difficult to understand that it could get to this point um, without any resolution. Knowing their own pets are also their canaries in the coal mine. What worries you the most? That this issue is not going to be fixed. Your heart sinks, you, you feel helpless. But avoiding toxic algae in the water may not be enough because we're about to show you how it gets into the air and where researchers are finding it. Blooms of cyanobacteria, or what we call toxic algae, can take many different forms, and each form emits a different mix of toxins. It can form lumps of brown gunk at the surface, or mats of green crust at the top, or make the water look like green paint. But there's something else we can't see that could be the scariest part of all. Dr. Mike Parsons is leading a series of experiments at Florida Gulf Coast University that may alarm you. The initial findings certainly alarmed him. When I first saw it, I, I was thinking, uh-oh. Because he found it's not just the water. The same toxins are also drifting into the air and are moving through the wind. I said, this is concerning because we're seeing it in the air. It means people can be exposed to toxins through the air. I just don't think they understand just how toxic and bad it really is. So. Alex and Missy Adelot had a feeling. 
we first met them in the town of Stewart, where their poodle died from drinking the toxic river water. Alex joined a Florida Atlantic University study. They did the testing. He came back um, positive for the cyanobacteria in his nostrils. Around 70 people exposed to the toxic blooms joined that same study. And the initial findings, which are under review, showed they all had liver toxin in their noses. But everybody came they back positive. They did say positive. that everyone that was tested was positive. And see that red blip just north of Stewart? Researchers at Ohio State University tied a cluster of the toxic blooms to a cluster of non-alcohol related liver disease in people. Which brings us back to Dr. Parsons' work. That could be why people were experiencing non-alcoholic liver damage by breathing it in. We know cyanobacteria produces the liver toxin microcystin and the brain toxin BMAA, which scientists have correlated with Lou Gehrig's disease. And we can generally spot explosions of cyanobacteria in water because it produces this signature blue-green slime. But scientists have not tested the air near those blooms in Florida until now. Is when the cyanobacteria dries, it'll almost be like a crust. I haven't done this, but it'd be the equivalent of like just grinding it up in your fingers and it turns into a powder, and then the winds would pick up that powder. So you can see it still, on the seawalls, just this like green dust. Florida Gulf Coast partnered with Yale University for these experiments. They line these canisters with filters that simulate human lungs, then place them at different sites and pump air through them for weeks at a time. The worst case scenario would be that a significant amount of microcystins and BMAA would be getting into the air and onto the smallest filters of our air samplers. They placed the first sampler at a volunteer's house in Cape Coral, where you could see patchy blooms in his backyard canal, and the results made them wince. Your test found both the liver toxin and the brain toxin here all the way down. All the way down. And from here, it could get into your bloodstream. Yes. And they didn't test last summer when the blooms in the water were most intense. A breeze came up and apparently some of the poison got into my eye. Last year, Deborah Moreland and her sister Teresa Anderson cleaned homes in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods in the state. Every time we were in certain neighborhoods, you could taste the chemical in the back of your throat. They said the water was like pea soup and green dust was all over the place. It was on windows, it was inside properties, it was everywhere. Teresa said she developed internal bleeding. Deborah got a lung infection. I'm very worried about the long-term effects. And both say they developed what appear to be neurological problems. Very forgetful. I couldn't hold on to things. I was dropping things all the time. So they closed their cleaning business and moved to Texas. Thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. To get moved and we're still sleeping on pallets on the floor because we can't afford beds. While they worked where the blooms were most severe, Dr. Parsons says you will find the same toxins in lakes, rivers, and neighborhoods and retention ponds all across the state. It will be in those ponds. So he is still testing for toxins in the air and trying to figure out where and if or to what extent they pose a risk to people. You know, is this a plausible risk that we need to explore more and understand better? And so far, the answer is yes. In exploring it more, he found the amount of toxins in the air appears to vary from place to place. And other scientists are now taking a closer look at the brain toxin he's found in the air and its possible effects on people. That's next. Well, scientists don't know what causes neurodegenerative diseases like ALS, but they appear to be finding some clues in tests across Florida. Scientists are finding things that could make you sick. They're making troubling discoveries in Florida's environment. Yes, you can see it's a completely different kind of beast. And their findings may put some of our prior investigations in a new light. For example, 11 years ago, we found a cluster of neurodegenerative disease near Kennedy Space Center. Engineers who were fighting ALS wondered if exposure to rocket fuel may have caused it. But new information is leading scientists to go back and ask questions about something else. You know, we're all these engineers, avid sportsmen. 
were these people in the water a lot. Years before the rocket engineers got sick, man-made pollution fed blooms of cyanobacteria in waters across the space coast. And cyanobacteria emit the brain toxin BMAA that scientists now link to diseases like Alzheimer's and ALS. What happens is the BMAA causes the proteins in your brain neurons to get all tangled up and that you see, see the slow accumulation of tangled up proteins in your neurons until they get completely clogged and then the neurons die. So you just slowly uh, develop uh, these uh, diseases over the time scale of 10 or 20 years. We first met Dr. Larry Brand at the University of Miami when he discovered BMAA in South Florida seafood. And while Dr. Brand found the brain toxin in Florida's marine food web, his colleagues had already found it at significant levels in Floridians with ALS and Alzheimer's. And when they tested others who did not have those diseases, they did not find BMAA in their brains. That paper was one of the seminal papers to detect uh, BMAA in human brain. Then Dr. David Davis started testing dolphins that have been turning up dead. So we wanted to see if you know these dolphins stranded may possibly have uh, the toxin in their system. His team tested seven dolphins found floating or beached in Florida and seven others to our north. 13 of 14 had high concentrations of BMAA in their brains, and the one that didn't had been struck and injured by a boat. Well, it's very, very startling um, to see that amount of BMAA in dolphins. It's roughly 1.5 times the amount we see in individuals with advanced dementia. And those dolphin brains containing BMAA also showed neurodegenerative changes consistent with Alzheimer's. What we found in the dolphin brain uh, are pathological hallmarks of dementia. Having both the presence of BMAA and also neuropathological changes like we see in the dolphins is troubling. You can see blooms of cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, because it produces green slime or muck in the water. And you can see why scientists say don't touch it or eat stuff caught near it. But new experiments have also revealed BMAA also drifts from the water into our air. We need to come up with some answers quickly. Which brings us to the work of Dr. Mike Parsons at Florida Gulf Coast University. When we first met him, his experiments confirmed BMAA was airborne in Cape Coral. His team followed up by testing other places. And yet again, the preliminary results may strike you. You know, we basically detected it everywhere we've looked. They found airborne BMAA in every spot they tested, and they found it in higher concentrations the closer they got to polluted water. What are the implications of that? That would indicate that you probably are at a higher risk closer to a water body than farther away. And that brings us back to a poodle named Finn. He drank blue-green algae from the St. Lucie River and died last year. This is really the first death of any sort um, in our local community. The necropsy showed Finn died from another toxin produced by cyanobacteria, microcystin, that strikes pets quickly. But his vet, Dr. Christina Maldonado, wondered if BMAA may also have built up in his brain over time. Finn spent his entire nine years right here at this house on this river, and he's been through three of the major blooms we have. So before she closed the case, she ordered one more test. I did send some of the deceased dog's brain to the brain chemistry lab in Wyoming, and they are checking it for BMAA. The scientists sent this email to Finn's owner, stating they did find BMAA in Finn's brain. They're still trying to determine what it means. If it's in his brain, who knows? While scientists have found a correlation between BMAA and brain diseases, they have not proven a cause and effect. You need more tests. You need more tests. And they don't even know how much it may take to make us sick. The scary part is if the levels get elevated to a point where that exposure would overcome our natural defenses. And what is that level? We don't know. And that part may trouble the public and scientists the most. There is justified concern by the public, and the science is a little behind. Well, the governor picked Dr. Parsons to serve on a new state task force to recommend policies and changes in strategy. 
We'll examine some of the options when we come back. When we see green slime or mats of crust in fresh or brackish water, that is likely toxic cyanobacteria. Dr. Michael Parsons is one of the five experts Governor DeSantis picked to come up with solutions. So we should have a good response plan in place to remove them. He says that starts with warning the public this green slime is dangerous, setting up an alert system in which people can easily report it, and activating cleanup crews to get rid of it. And so it's almost easier just to kill it and sink it, but now you have a sludge problem you're creating. Yep. And so that could, you know, fertilize next year's bloom. And we already have so much sludge in the water and fertilizer mixed into soil from years ago that that alone can feed more blooms for years yet to come. They don't even have to add phosphate onto the fields anymore. And you're still having high levels of phosphate leaching into the waters. That could be happening for decades. Well, we'll continue to follow the science, the recommendations, and to what extent state leaders follow through. Thank you for watching this special investigation of the toxic water crisis in Florida.